so yes, pleased to introduce Harriet. Harriet is a third year PhD student at the University of Reading, where she also studied for an undergraduate degree in environmental physics. Harriet's PhD work explores improving forecasts from solar wind data assimilation, and these impressive research outputs are evidenced in part by um, their three first author publications during their PhD. So I'll hand over to Harriet, um, and then we'll have question time afterwards. Great, uh, thank you for the intro and thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, solar wind data assimilation in an operational context um, and the use of near real time data and the forecast value of an L5 monitor. Um, yeah, so I'm Harriet and my supervisors are Matt Owens, uh, Matt Lang, um, and Mike Marsh and Siegfried Von Zee, who are from the Met Office. Um, so, what is the solar wind? Uh, it's a constant stream of charged particles that flows off the sun and fills the heliosphere or the solar system. It is comprised mostly of electrons, protons and ions and rather dramatically looks like this, although this is both not a scale and an artist's impression. Um, the solar wind drags out the sun's magnetic field um, and due to the rotation of the sun it is pulled into an Archimedean spiral although the solar wind flow is mostly radial. So as shown by this animation, which I hope is moving for you, um, it's mostly bimodal. So we have streams of fast solar wind. Uh, so you can see uh, in the yellow and streams of slower solar wind in the blue. Um, and with respect to Earth, we have a full rotation in approximately 27 days. So corona mass ejections um, or CMEs are huge eruptions of solar material from the sun and they are the main driver of severe space weather. Um, so Cameron gave a good introduction for space weather, so thanks for that. Um, but they propagate through the solar wind. So the background conditions will affect their speed and arrival time. So as you can see in this little animation here, um, a CME injected into this uh, fast solar wind stream. You can see that it, the front is distorted. Um, so the idea is that if we can improve the forecasting conditions of the background solar wind, we'll be able to model these corona mass ejections more effectively. Um, and this is just a, a real animation of uh, CME. So you can see just how big they are. So this white line here is the, the outline of the sun. Um, so you can just see how huge these eruptions are. Um, so why should we care about this? Um, so space weather, as Cameron said, um, the changing plasma conditions in near Earth space, and this poses a significant threat to modern technology. Uh, extreme space weather is on the UK's national risk register which is, it's not the nicest likelihood against impact. Um, and a few things to highlight include pandemics, we're all aware of those, although this matrix does not include uh, COVID-19. Uh, coastal and river flooding, heat waves, um, and severe space weather is sort of just in the middle there. Um, and you've already seen this diagram but these are a few of the impacts of space weather. So uh, satellite impacts uh, on the railways, of course, um, but aurora, brighter aurora as well. So it's not, I guess it's not all bad. Um, but yeah, so current solar wind forecasting is typically a coronal model coupled to heliospheric model. Um, so the coronal model takes photospheric observations which will then feed into the model, for example, WSA or the wang Juli RG model. And these give conditions at 0.1 AU or 10% of the distance from the sun to the earth, which is about the top of the corona or the sun's outer atmosphere. And out of this, we get solar wind speed and magnetic field. These are then used in the heliospheric model for example, NMIL, 
uh, which is large MHD or magnetohydrodynamic model. Other models are available, I should say, but the WSA NLIL uh, system is what the Met Office is using. Uh, and out of NLIL, we'll get uh, solar wind speed, magnetic field, uh, number density and temperature. And these can be uh, propagated to Earth. So this is where data assimilation kind of comes in. So data assimilation or DA uh, combines prior information, usually uh, from a model, uh, with observations to find an optimum estimation of reality. It's been used a lot in terrestrial weather forecasting and it's had to led to really large forecast improvements, but it has been really underused in space weather. Um, so it, in space weather, it's been used in uh, three main areas, uh, the photosphere, the solar wind and the ionosphere. So it's most advanced in the ionosphere, a bit less advanced in the photosphere, and then really not used at all in the solar wind, which is where sort of my project and some of the work that's been done at Reading uh, comes in. Uh, and yeah, so these are the, the three areas that it's been used in. Um, so I've been using something called the Berger Radius Variational Data Assimilation Scheme, or BRAVDA, uh, which has been developed at the University of Reading, uh, mostly by Matt Lang, one of my supervisors. Um, and it combines observations uh, from spacecraft uh, with a steady state solar wind model. So essentially in the current forecasting scheme, uh, we take the photospheric observations and essentially from there, the models are free running, so they're not constrained by observations. So BRAVDA takes this information from the observations um, and combines it with the, the prior inner boundary condition from a coronal model uh, to produce a sort of an optimum estimation of the solar wind. And I'm just going to give a little with some crude animations of how BRAVDA works. So we have the sun in the middle and Earth at 1 AU here. So at time T0, we'll take an observation. So we're taking an observations from 1 AU here. Now, if we try to update uh, the system at 1 AU due to the radial flow of the solar wind, any update would just get swept away. So what we have to do is essentially run it backwards. And we do this by using something called the adjoint model and we take that observation back to the inner boundary which is at 0.1 AU. We then update that inner boundary condition and then we run the model forwards again with that updated inner boundary. So through these rather crude um, animations and then we can use that updated uh, background to then run forwards in time. Um, I should have sped this up, but there we go. And we end up with an updated uh, solar wind for Earth. So again, this is just uh, the diagram from before of the current forecasting, but in using DA, we take the solar wind speed from the inner boundary, use that in BRAVDA, along with observations of the solar wind, which leads to an updated solar wind speed, which can then be used for forecasting at Earth. So the observations I've been using have been coming from the stereo mission. So, uh, that stands for Solar Terrestrial Relations Observatory. And there are two spacecraft, the ahead and behind. So they're separated from Earth in longitude. Uh, they were launched in 2007, um, but communication with Stereo B was lost in 2014. Uh, so a lot of the forecasts I've been creating are actually technically hindcasts because um, I've been using archive data. Um, I've also been using observations from ACE, the Advanced Composition Explorer, launched in 1997, 
um, and DISCOVER, which is the Deep Space Climate Observatory. And both of those give near Earth observations from L1, which is on the Sun Earth line. Uh, which is it. Um, so, this is just an example of an output from uh, Bravda. So, we have our prior conditions. So, this is before any DA and the posterior, which is after DA. So you can see that there has been quite a bit of change um, when this the scheme has been updated with the observations. So you can see, for example, this uh, stream here has massively reduced in magnitude. This one has all but disappeared. And this one's been made a bit wider uh, when it's been updated. So we get this output from Bravda, but how have I been using it for forecasting? So essentially, I've been using co-rotation, which is saying that the conditions in the next side of rotation will be the same as the conditions in the past one. So we take, so for our time T, we take the previous 27 days of uh, simulation, uh, from the assimilation window, and we say that the next 27 days will look the same, and then we get our forecast window. Um, but for Bravda to be able to be used operationally, it needs to be able to work with real time. So previous experiments have used science level data, which is pre-processed, uh, to provide a much cleaner data, data set. Uh, so like data gaps have been reduced, uh, biases and erroneous observations have been uh, removed. Um, so for example, work by Lang et al 21 and my previous work as well has used this science level data. But uh, for an operational forecast system, we would need uh, it to work with a constant stream of real-time data, which can include some problems. For example, uh, this is just a time series of, of a month's worth of data from ACE and the two stereo, stereo um, spacecraft. Um, so in the red line, we've got archived real-time data, and the black line is the, the processed science level data. So you can see with ACE, we have these step changes. Um, so there's clearly been some problem um, and it is just assumed that during this gap, the solar wind speed has been the same. Um, stereo A is actually pretty good. There's a couple of tiny little gaps, but mostly they agree really well. Um, but as you can see, Stereo B has sort of lost the plot a bit. Um, and there's a lot of noise. There's a bit of a bias. Um, it's actually turned out to be an issue with the real-time detector um, after a little bit of digging. But yeah, you can see that there can be some real problems with uh, the real-time data feed. And similarly with Discover, we've got these big spikes in solar wind speed, which I believe are caused when uh, the density gets low um, and it can't work out what the solar wind speed is from that. Um, so Bravda needs to be able to cope with these problems to be able to be used um, in an operational context. So I run some experiments um, assimilating all sources of observations, so from Stereo A, Stereo B and from ACE, um, and then evaluating the forecast accuracy at the three observation locations um, and using the science data as the best estimation of the truth. So using that as the verification time series and comparing a forecast using the prior, so before any DA um, and the real time forecasts and the science forecasts. Um, and fortunately, we found out that the science and the real time are actually pretty similar. Um, so and using the real-time data does not significantly worsen the forecast, which uh, has is really good implications for using uh, solo and DA operationally. Um, but what we also found out is that um, both the science and the real-time has 
caused significant improvements compared to the prior. So including ob uh, information from the observations means that we get a better forecast. And also using um, L1 co-rotation, so that's just taking the observations from uh, L1, so from near Earth, and using them as the forecast through co-rotation, uh, using the, the DA um, produces a better forecast than just L1 co-rotation or uh, persistence, as it can be called. So what does this mean for future solo NDA? Um, so the ESA vigil mission is um, hopefully going to be launched sort of towards the late uh, 2020s uh, to the L5 point, which is 60 degrees behind Earth um, in longitude. Um, and a quote from ESA is that the mission will give us advanced warning of oncoming solar storms and therefore more time to protect spacecraft in orbit, infrastructure on the ground and explorers now and in the future unshielded by Earth's magnetic field and vulnerable to our star's violent outbursts. Um, but for us, that could be useful for future operational solar wind DA. So I ran a few experiments simulating a pairing between uh, an L5 and an L1 uh, spacecraft. So I used historic data to see how well this could work. Um, and this led to four time periods. So using combinations of ACE for near Earth and the stereo spacecraft, there are four time periods where uh, the spacecraft are separated by 60 degrees in longitude. Um, for this case, I used a range of 50 to 70 degrees just to increase the data available. Um, but again, we find that both the real time um, and the science were very similar, but also that when we compare a simulation of only L1, so only near Earth, and um, a simulation of both L1 and L5, for forecast lead times of less than five days, uh, we get a much improved um, error. Uh, so the forecast is improved for lead times of less than five days. Uh, this is better shown on this plot, which is an average of those four. And again, we have a much improved forecast from the prior um, but also, and from L1 co-rotation. But also we are seeing a slight improvement from using co-rotation from L5. Uh, from which the observations are only about five days old. Um, and But the benefit of using the DA is that we get a reconstruction of the whole domain rather than a point estimate, which means that we can propagate a CME through the output from the DA, whereas from co-rotation, we can't do that because it is just a point a point forecast. So looking for the future, um, currently working on a semi-operational version of Bravda uh, just to see how well this would work in an operational context. Um, the pieces are all there um, but just need pulling together and we're hoping for a daily updated forecast which would be a world's first using solo and DA mm -hmm. and apparently I need to write a thesis um, but yeah, the jury's out on that. Uh, so to finish off, uh, knowledge of the solar wind is important for both timing and accurate space weather forecasting. Uh, the Bravda scheme reconstructs a full solar rotation using available observations, and this leads to an improved solar wind forecast. And a future L5 and L1 spacecraft pairing could be useful for operational solar wind DA. Um, so there's a few references. And this work was all written up into a paper and published in Space Weather, if you'd like to have a read. Um, so thank you for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions.